All right, well, welcome, a very warm welcome to everyone who's joined us today for this webinar. My name is Natalie Drew and I work in the Policy, Law and Human Rights Unit of the World Health Organization and I'm based in Geneva. So as many of you by now know, this webinar is the third in a series of uh, webinars that we're running on uh, throughout the year, looking at different aspects of creating mental health systems and services uh, that do not use coercion and that really promote a rights-based and recovery-oriented approach. And the purpose of today's webinar is in fact to really zoom in on uh, the practical aspects of implementing a recovery approach. So the recovery approach has been championed by people with lived experience since the 1990s and has really been instrumental in actually promoting human rights in the area of mental health. But recovery itself isn't considered a human rights explicitly, but nevertheless, both recovery and human rights have a number of common principles, uh, including, for example, the need for a transformative move away from a, a biomedical model and towards a supportive model or approach that really values diversity, um, autonomy, connection, community inclusion, and so on. Um, so recovery basically means supporting people to find meaning and purpose in life, whether that could be through their work, through educational opportunities they might want to pursue, through their relationships, community engagement, and other meaningful pursuits. Um, but despite the sort of increased recognition of the importance and the usefulness of the recovery approach, um, there's still quite a significant gap in terms of its actual implementation in practice, in services and on the ground. So that's why we're really pleased today to be able to um, have with us two very different um, examples of efforts that are being undertaken uh, in very different contexts, in fact, but both trying to introduce recovery, recovery approaches, recovery planning within services. So we hope you will use this webinar to really dig deeper into the issue, to ask questions, to share your own experiences. And the idea really with all of these webinars is that they be dynamic, interactive, and that you really participate, everyone, the, the audience, the speakers all together. Um, another thing that I just want to mention is it, I would encourage all of you to do the Quality Rights e-training, which you can actually find uh, the link to in the chat and I will add the link also at the end because basically this gives you a foundational understanding um, about recovery oriented approaches in mental health. So I think that's a very useful um, activity for, to, to, to embark on doing the e-training training will give you that sort of foundational knowledge and um, yeah for it, it, to sort of deepen your knowledge on these areas. Um, in the chat, you'll also find other um, useful resources. So there'll be WH information, more information about the Quality Rights Initiative, but you'll also find the links to our training resources and tools on recovery, but also on other aspects of um, uh, ending coercive practices. So do have a look through those as well. I'd like to thank our moderator and our speakers uh, for being with us here today to share their experience and their expertise. I'm gonna now hand over to Dr. Gregory Keane who'll be moderating the webinar. Greg, let me just give a little bit of background about Greg. So Greg is a psychiatrist and a health service strategist uh, working in the general community and at risk populations internationally. Um, he has experience working with indigenous peoples, with vulnerable communities in urban settings, with refugees and displaced people, and also with military veterans with mental health difficulties. He spent 10 years working for Doctors Without Borders as a clinician, as a technical advisor, as an MHPSS researcher, 
with various different projects, uh, MSF projects, including in countries like Iraq, Afghanistan, Gaza, the West Bank, Yemen, Jordan, and parts of West Africa. Uh, he also has a strong interest and involvement in developing uh, who quality rights approaches specifically in the humanitarian context. So over to you, Greg, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Natalie. Thanks, Natalie Michelle, for, um, for having me here today. I'm very excited to be here for this fantastic topic on recovery. We've got a very interesting range of speakers for us today. And um, uh, Natalie's given us a brief introduction on, on recovery. Um, so I'm going to introduce the speakers and then move into a short introduction um, uh, before we move on to introducing every and before we move on to introducing uh, the, the, the first presentation. So if people do have questions, um, please raise your hands rather than putting the question in, in the comments, though you can do that too if you want, though we might miss you. Um, so um, to, to start with, I'd like to introduce the speakers that um, we're going to have today. First of all, uh, Peter McGovern. Peter is a psychiatrist dedicated to developing rights-based approaches to mental health and supporting people with psychosocial disabilities. He's a consultant psychiatrist at Modenbad's Trauma Polyklinken in Oslo, Norway. And he has a special interest in psychoanalytic, psychoanalytic psychotherapy, as well as systemic approaches to understanding mental health conditions. Peter's a key contributor um, to the development of the WHO quality rights guidance and training tools. And he continues to work with WHO as a quality rights consultant and trainer around the world. And joining Peter today is Jan. Uh, Jan was a member of one of Modenbad's recovery groups in 2023, and we're lucky to have him here with us today. He'll share his own experience of being part of that group. Thank you, Jan. Um, we're going to also, we're also fortunate to have with us today, Jacob um, Shamirarira. He's a person with lived experience um, from Zimbabwe who, um, who struggled with substance use disorder. And after recovering, Jacob has set up a nonprofit organization uh, working in mental health and is playing a leading role in the promotion of quality rights and other mental health in, um, interventions in his country. Uh, finally, we have Alexei uh, Kosti, uh, Kosti Yuchenkov, who works at the WHO country office in Ukraine, and he's been supporting efforts there to introduce recovery approach and recovery planning within community-based mental health teams in the country. So welcome to you all. It's fantastic to have you all here. Um, so what I'm gonna do is jump straight in and ask Natalie to share the, um, a very short slide of introduction. Um, and I'll go through that with you now. Thank you, Natalie. So as a brief reminder for everyone, um, uh, a recovery plan, first of all, is a user-driven document, um, definitely not clinician-driven, that is created and implemented by people themselves. And um, the plan can obviously change over time to reflect the person's own recovery journey and their, and their preferences as they evolve with time. And people can develop the plan with other people um, in, in consultation with others if they want. But what's really essential, what's so crucial about this is that people themselves are the ones who decide what they want to include or to not include. So um, to get started, the, uh, the, the, the tool we're going to be talking about today is person-centered recovery planning for mental health and well-being by a quality rights team. Um, and I'll just be calling it the tool today. Um, and uh, the tool takes people through the process of how to develop a recovery plan. And it takes five, um, it covers five areas that are, that are shown here. Planning for pursuing dreams and goals, a wellness plan, a plan for managing difficult times, which is so important for responding to a crisis as well and what to do after that crisis. So very much um, a holistic approach. Thanks, Natalie. Can we move on to the next slide? Thank you. So that first part, the plan for pursuing dreams and goals. So a key component um, in the creation of a recovery plan is a plan for producing, for um, pursuing, um, for someone um, pursuing their own dreams and goals. And as a first step, the person is going to identify their dreams and goals. 
for some people it might be a big dream for others it might be small things um, and dreams can be about really specific things that people want to achieve for instance getting a job um, doing volunteer work maybe finding friends or finding friends to share hobbies with or something as simple as reading a book um, or making some art and then the person will identify those specific steps um, to achieving that goal or those goals and those dreams and really thinking about what is um, what are the person's uh, um, strengths, what are their interests and their capacities, and what are those about around of those um, strengths and capacities of people around them that can also help them. So very dynamic, um, and and very much about um, about what the person wants to achieve in in their own life. Natalie, can we have the next slide? Thanks. Right. So the next thing is a wellness plan. So how do we put that into place? And we're going to hear a lot more about this um, from Peter and Jan later. Um, it's about uh, helping to identify routines um, uh, that, he, that help keep people well, and also those things that might have a negative impact on mental health. So positive routines, things like eating, eating healthily, eating at regular times, doing exercise, walking, and then thinking about what are the negative routines that also might make that a bit more difficult, things like sitting around and doing nothing, maybe uh, using substances as well. Um, and so thinking about what is the balance of my wellness? Natalie, thanks. Um, obviously, very importantly, um, is sometimes uh, when people are suffering mental health difficulties, they come through difficult times. And planning in advance for those things even though we definitely don't want them to happen is really is really so so helpful um thinking about um uh how to how to um deal better with your own emotional distress and how to identify those sensitivities and signs of distress um and sometimes identifying those sensitivities um, means that we can take action much more quickly when we've got distress so um that can really um uh, reduce the chance if you know what those things are of finding yourselves in a crisis and then also thinking about who you want to share that with and for other people around you who care about you and support you and who trust to be aware of what those sensitivities and signs are um, so that they can um, discuss um, with the person who they're supporting if they see those things with their permission and then the fourth thing is responding to a crisis so the plan for responding to a crisis um, allows people to um, provide directions on when and how and where um, and from whom they'd like to receive support. And also allow specifically people to specify no to certain treatments. So very, very much uh, this is what the person wants and also specifically what they don't want based on possibly on experiences that they've had before that they weren't happy with. And that's very, very empowering. And there might be also several things that the person might want to be uh, taken care of if they were going through a crisis. For instance, um, maybe you have a pet who's going to look after the pet. Uh, perhaps um, you have some bills that you're not going to be that are going to be outstanding, um, or you might have a regular appointment uh, that that is that that happens for you, and you'd like someone to help you um, to cancel that or to let someone else know that you won't be attending. So really about empowering you and removing during that crisis things that might stress you or things that are really important to you that can help you. Um, and then crucially, it allows people like myself, mental health clinicians, to really understand and support someone better. Um, and so we can make sure that we respect the person's will and their preferences in that crisis. And uh, this is definitely about a recovery journey. So what about after the crisis? And it's really about helping people get back to their daily life and maintaining wellness after that. So what are my routines? Um, uh, what are the, the things I'm gonna be doing in the next uh, days to weeks? How do I step back into the things that, I, uh, that are important for me to do in my day-to-day -day life? And, and really crucially, again, what, what have I learned about, about myself and about this and about what I want in the future? So um, what we're going to do now is move into that. So uh, that's pretty much it for the presentation, just to summarize that for you. And I'm going to ask Peter and Jan to jump in 
with their presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much, Greg. Uh, so really lovely for, for us both to be here. Jan and I have agreed that that I'm going to start a little bit and, and maybe introduce more of the the structural aspect of how we got these groups uh, going and, and what they actually look like in practice. And then Jan and I are going to have a bit of a conversation about what it was actually like to go in in in, uh, in our group. So so I as as was said in the introduction, I work in a, a specialized trauma center. Um, we uh, one of the things that I feel quite strongly about from my professional background is that I, I don't think that that the stuff that's in quality rights, the stuff that's in a recovery approach and a, a human rights based approach, I think it's uh, not just an important ideological and paradigm shift uh, for all mental health services. I feel very strongly that this is a, a really important and, and quite transformative clinical tool as well. Uh, and that, I guess, was, was one of the things that led to the creation of our uh, trauma-oriented recovery planning groups. Um, we we kind of, uh, I, I personally have been using the, the recovery plan for, for quite a few years, but I wanted to, we wanted to kind of operationalize it and make it a kind of central part of our, um, uh, our support offer here at the at the trauma clinic so so what we what we've done is we we've, we've uh, um, um, used the the uh, quality rights recovery plan and and, and turned it into a, a group based um, uh, program uh, so we have an eight week uh, eight week group uh, which we call our TORP group so the the trauma orientated recovery planning group uh, where uh, nine people together with two facilitators uh, have the opportunity to create a recovery plan uh, for themselves uh, and share the experience of creating that recovery plan in a group format. Um, uh, so. We're talking about twice a week um, uh, sessions. So we have a, a physical session that's around one hour, 15 minutes. And then we have a digital check-in session that's about a half an hour slightly later in the week. Um, and quite quickly, this became a, a very popular uh, approach and something that, that people uh, felt was quite useful and effective in helping and supporting them on their recovery journey. Uh, one of the, the interesting kind of clinical overlaps here from, from my point of view is that often in, in trauma, people that have experienced difficult things in life, there can be a, a certain amount of avoidance behavior that can build up around different things that can happen. Uh, people describe to us quite regularly that they feel trapped in a, in a pattern uh, where the same things happen over and over again without having the opportunity to really look at that in what we call peacetime when things are actually going pretty well uh, to then make a bit of a proactive plan. Think about how can I deal with, uh, with difficult times in a little bit of a different way. Who do I have around me in terms of my support network? Who shall I give which uh, which um, uh, uh, role to? And and not least to have the opportunity to be together with other people that maybe have uh, similar experiences, similar life experience, similar lived experience, um, uh, to kind of share uh, that uh, that approach and and use each other as a, a as a resource. Um, and and that is uh, that's so really we we divide up the plan uh, over the course of eight sessions and we work with it uh, uh, quite actively to to build a plan. Uh, as Greg said in his introduction, this is not something that I as a clinician drive or or have control over. This is uh, something that that we're very focused on making sure that people realize that this is a different type of document. This is a document that that we want people to have ownership of themselves, that they're the ones that decide what they do with the plan, what it looks like, what's included, what's not included. We've had everything from people that 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 use the plan and follow the kind of WHO plan uh, after the letter. We've had other people that have 
created used it as an opportunity to have some important conversations around uh, planning for the future and planning for difficult times and and f- focusing on goals and dreams they have and we've had other people that have interacted with with the group in a much more creative way that have that have uh, written poetry um, songs uh, to try and encapsulate that recovery journey and what they're trying to do uh, so we we really encourage people to have a, as broad an interaction with it as possible. One small thing I'll also kind of add in that's maybe different since uh, uh, Jan has uh, took the course last year is we've now also uh, allowed all participants to take the e uh, the quality rights e learning course in addition to the group. Um, so we really wanted to kind of build up that uh, uh, basic knowledge on recovery, the human rights approach, and that's something that's proved uh, very popular and quite empowering for people as well. So I'm really uh, delighted today that that uh, Jan was was willing to 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 join me uh, and 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 be along with us today. Uh, and Jan, as as Greg said, you you took the course uh, uh, about uh, about a year a year and a half a year ago or so. Um, first of all, welcome, and and second, I just wonder whether you'd like to say a little bit about what it was what it was like to go in the recovery group what uh, what was your experience of it uh, thank you peter uh, for the first um, sessions i felt it uh, quite uh, difficult because it was uh, a new experience to go <clears throat> to a course that changes from the normal learning uh, from the teachers to to give us something uh, but while this time it was we who's going to give to ourselves. Mm. Yeah. So um, that was a, a little bit journey at the start uh, to start to see uh, me uh, as a re- resource in my own life. Mm. Mm. And I, I remember, yeah, we had a lot of conversations in that group about how different that was there was almost an expectation in the group that that something would be given out or the the answer would be given and and it, it took us some time as a group to really work with that uh, that idea that the answers and and the resources are already there in us I, i'm curious as to as to what do you think what what was what was different about that approach compared to maybe other things that that you've uh, uh, been involved in in the past or or what what struck you as new or important it was uh, our own possibility possibility to to um, talk in the group learn from each other and um, we were also quite different, so we could get different perspectives of things that are happening in our own life and how others are tackling them and how they want to go further so we can learn from each other. Yeah, yeah. And and that was something that you and I have discussed quite recently together, Jan, that... that that you felt that it was kind of a strength almost to do this as a group project to kind of be together with other people with different perspectives and i remember you said that it's not always that we've got the answers ourselves and it's kind of a a, a positive to hear experiences and and solutions and things that help in other people's lives that that was a bit of an inspiration for you as well yes uh, it was uh it made the, the yeah. um, group uh, to attend there was um, got more easy uh, when we could use it, each other and talk uh, and learn from each other. And uh, when we should start to make those different plans, it was nice to hear other people put their words on maybe things I struggle with mm. so uh, but you don't always see it yourself but when you listen to others in a group and you have a similar uh, goal uh, it was uh, a great experience mm. uh, would you mind Jan saying a bit about 
like how the how the recovery plan or the group process how, how that helped you personally if you have any reflections on that uh yes um one of the things that uh, was important to me was to look at the resources around me uh and what uh how i could use them and i found out that uh I needed to, uh, to do some changes uh, to this group because when I needed help, I'm not always used the right ones. Uh, so it was, it was uh, a learning from me and um, that made me do some changes. Mm -hmm. uh, for my own life, it was also good to put myself as a resource <laughs> i'm mm. not used to that yeah uh, i'm used to uh, just say okay that's life and I, uh, i'm not good enough or something but to go to a group and and uh, working with uh, being a resource in my own life it was very helpful mm. And I remember that being quite a big topic for for the group uh, as well that that it was almost unusual and refresh refreshing to have that focus on the resources I have the kind of idea of of changing the narrative around ourselves and also being able to to um make sure that our voice is always heard and our will and preferences is something that's actively communicated to people around us. I'm aware of time, Jan, that we've we've got kind of limited time left. Uh, but one one more question I was just curious about was whether you whether you kind of thought that that recovery approach that that uh, more resource uh, focused um, uh, approach whether whether that maybe has a, a role more broadly or or something that you personally would like to see more of or any thoughts on that. It's uh it made a, a difference in my life, and uh, uh, it also went to uh, mention that we were went to a, a summer break mm -hmm. in uh, my course, and we had the experience to come back after four weeks, and tell each other how our plans went, and mm -hmm. we could learn even more from each other, mm -hmm. um, and. I've been using my document also for this presentation, uh, how I could get some help around me, use the resources that are in my life. And I know we, we've talked a bit about that, even though that this is quite a, you know, for all of us probably a bit, uh, uh, we get a bit nervous in, in, a, in a big presentation and that you were kind of actively using your support network and actively planning about how you can take some positive risks here, but also use the resources you have around you in a positive way. Yes. Um, so uh, it made me come here today and uh, it was, uh, yeah. That's great. I I know we're 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 out of time, Greg. I, I kind of can pass uh, pass it back over to you. I could talk all day. Yeah. It was an absolute pleasure to have you here. Thanks for your courage and for sharing. And I I really a lot of people have commented, um, have put in the comments and um and I wrote down as you were talking um about being a resource in your own life and a resource for the other people in the group. And I I just want to take that message with us today as well. So thank you so much for being here, um and and sharing that um that knowledge and uh and uh, that experience with us. Um, uh, I'm, I, I know that I'm going to take it away and I'm sure all of us are here too today. So thank you. Um, what I'd like to do now is actually move to you, Jacob, and ask a question. Um, Jacob, uh, do you think this is something that could work in Zimbabwe and, and what would need to happen to make it work? What's, what's your thoughts? Right, uh, thanks, Greg. And uh, thanks, Jan, for, for sharing your experiences. So, yeah, looking at Zimbabwe, um, a few years ago, trying to implement some of these interventions would have been quite difficult and a huge task. But since the coming in of the special initiative for mental health, a lot of opportunities um, have been presented 
in terms of rolling out some of these uh, useful interventions. So yes, I would say it is something that uh, we can do, something that can be done in Zimbabwe. And it, there's so much in terms of the human resources and organizations working in Zimbabwe that um, presents an opportunity for us to bolt onto it. So I just want to touch on, on a few of those. For example, um, the service providers, um, quite a lot of mental health um, skills are being delivered through the image gap intervention. So we now have a bit of understanding on how to deliver mental health interventions and the quality rights e-training has been rolled out to a lot of service providers. Then within the service user community, there is a growing network of people with lived experience who are coming together um, to share their experiences and knowledge on how to prepare for crises, know much more about the, the quality rights, know what the triggers are and how to uh, mitigate a crisis when it starts. So the community sensitizations are quite helpful as well in reducing the stigma that used to be a huge problem around mental health. So with the reduction of stigma, it then you know, gives people with lived experience like myself and others and current service users to have more courage and resilience um, and be bold enough to say, this is how I'd like my recovery plan to, to work out. Uh, and obviously working in consultation with their family members, members of the community and the service providers. So in short, yes, it is something that can be done in Zimbabwe. The scope for it is there. Um, and I think what really needs to be done is just to scale up and step up some of the already uh, existing interventions, um, such as the community nurses. There are nurses in the community who can help to follow up uh, on the different interventions that are, that are being done. So yeah, that's my, my response to our perspectives from Zimbabwe. Thank you so much. What I'm going to do is open up the um, um, open up to um, the uh, the um, the audience and see if people have got any questions. So put your hand up if you've got questions that you'd like to ask uh, um, Peter, for instance, Jacob. Um, uh, and um, in the meantime, I'm going to ask a question, and that is, um, I, I guess um, one of the things. Uh, Peter, that I often hear um, from people is we don't have the time um, for something like this. Um, and uh, I mean, I've got lots of answers that I might give to people in response to that. But I wonder what 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 have you said to people in this implementation process when they've said something like that to you? Yeah, I, I think I think that's the the beauty in many ways of of the recovery approach that this can be done in so many ways. It can be done in a kind of a, a more structured structured way that we that we did it in our clinic in a group format, or it can actually be started by people with lived experience themselves. Uh, you know, I I know people that work actively with uh, with these recovery plans. I also kind of think that that recovery planning and and the kind of uh, supported decision making aspects and and the and the um, uh, the future directives aspects here. Th this is a time investment that saves a lot of time and effort uh, or uh, at at later dates as well. Um, that's why I'm so focused on it as a as a really useful clinical tool. I think if I'm supporting someone, if I'm working with someone. The most important information I can get from that person is how would you like to uh, be supported if things get tough? What can I do that can help or what can I avoid doing because we know that doesn't work or that that makes things worse? You know, I see that as a, as a rights issue, but I also see that as a as a core good clinical practice issue as well. Uh, and I, I think really not having time to to give good clinical care and good support that that's usually not an excuse to flies anymore thankfully fantastic thank you for that we do have a couple of questions so far so um um, um Ishil, i wonder if you, you you'd like to um voice your question that you put in the comments please feel feel welcome I'm not sure if Ishul's there. I might just um, ask that for Ishul. Um, 
was the therapy group a substitute to individual sessions was one of the questions that was asked. Good question. Yes and no. It, it, it kind of depends. Some some of the people that would have gone in the group, they would have individual sessions in addition. Um, uh, and, and other people uh, felt that they were perhaps finished with, with individual therapy and, and, and wanted to have this focus exclusively. Those people that, that did have individual uh, support, you know, that could be any type of therapist or, or, or supportive person, they were usually encouraged to share that plan and to share the process and involve uh, people as much as possible. We, we've had a, a big request from the last few groups that people want to involve family members even more, and we're thinking about how we can actively involve uh, support players uh, even more and kind of draw them into the process in an even more concrete way. Fantastic. So, like, it, you know, I mean, what, what I'm hearing is that uh, um, the process that you're that you're developing is 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 quite organic in a way. It's really responding to what people with lived experience, uh, with what people are saying that they want, and uh, and and I think that's exactly what we should be doing. It's the essence of recovery. Um, it's person centred. Mm -hmm. um, um, Olga Olga Kalina, one of our um, our, our quality rights experts, um, who's also in the audience today. Olga, you had a question. I wonder whether you could. Um, speak that to us is that would you be able to join us yeah. by voice uh, i have practical question because we, we have similar um, activity in georgia and um, i'm just interested how you are doing it in your group sessions uh, are participants supposed to develop recovery plans or parts of the plans during these group sessions or are they like using these group sessions just as preliminary activity to discuss things and later then they develop plans independently from the group because uh, sometimes uh, people have some you know uh, confidential or individual issues that they may not be uh, ready to share readily in the group so maybe you can elaborate on that. Thank you. Yeah, no, great question, Olga. So, so um, again, the the kind of yes and, and and no answer there. One thing I'm quite clear about in the groups is it's not that again we have to, I I feel we have to move away from the fact I don't have an expectation that people do their homework or that people do the plan and and get to the point that the plan is totally done. I'm very happy that if people are just at the group, use it as a source of inspiration and then maybe perhaps work with a more concrete plan at a later date. There's some people that do that. There's some people that work with it quite structurally uh, during the course of the group. The most important thing for me is it's the person themselves that decides how they interact with the material, how they use it and how much they, they want to share. Uh, we have some kind of uh, rules for, for all our groups. We tend not to, to share too much kind of uh, um, information that can trigger about, about past experiences or, or past traumas. We try to hold our focus to, 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 the, to the here and now. Um, uh, and some people share quite actively what's in their plan and other people kind of keep that a little bit more private and, and don't want to share it and talk more generally around the theme Themes and and some of the quite existential themes that that kind of come come forward through the plan. It's very clarifying. Thank you very much, Peter. I'm going to move to um, someone in the audience, Renu Varun. Renu, would you like to um, ask your question, and then I'll move on to Michelle. Uh, yes. Hi. Thank you, Greg, and thank you, everyone else, for allowing me this opportunity. Um, I have put something in the chat as well. Uh, you know. Um, I'm from India and I currently live in Dubai. So um, we have been working in the space of prevention of suicide for the last 25 years. And uh, somehow, uh, you know, it's, as I mentioned in the chat, it's a bit like mentioning, uh, 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 I mean, it, we just take an analogy, an example of Harry Potter somehow to, point the time, uh, 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 yeah, drive the point home, right? Um, I'll just share a very quick statistics uh, with the group. And that's where my question sits. Uh, you know, in 2021 in India, uh, the number of deaths by suicide uh, were more than the number of deaths by road accidents. And the 2022 figure is also the same. 
I mean, it's if it's not uh, more, that is, because suicide is hugely underreported. Um, having been in the space for last 25 years, uh, the challenges, of course, is the stigma, the silence, the financial constraints, uh, the free assistance expectation, you know, uh, that's like an epitome of uh, um, working in the social sector. And then the lack of understanding around suicide. So these are, uh, you know, very um, realistic challenges that we are facing in uh, Southeast Asia, you can call it, you can call it the um, you know, you can call it the low and medium income countries. I mean, whatever title that you want to give. And uh, now, uh, however, uh, we we are in the space for 25 years and there is no looking back or uh, kind of feeling defeated or discouraged because this is what we live for. Um, talking of the wellness plan, you know, we have recently designed a wellness plan uh, my, we call it my wellness plan, my well-being plan, and we are getting it translated in, I think, we are trying to get it translated into all African languages and Indian languages. Uh, but yes, the perennial challenge that we face, and this is where I would really want to know, uh, how do we bridge the gap between the stigma, the financial constraints, the support from the government, Right, because the moment we are going to um, the agencies, uh, they are uh, kind, it's not a priority. Like for example, in India, the mental health budget is 1%. And- uh, Renu, I might just jump, jump in and ask, is, uh, just to, if we can move on to the question, because I do want to catch another couple of people. Um, yes. You, you, were, you were kind of summarizing that, um, uh, you were asking a question about, I think, linking, um, I guess, uh, you know, in terms of budget and time and how we achieve all of this at the same time. Uh, more, and, and also equally on the awareness, you know, because the stigma is another uh, huge uh, deterrent mm -hmm. and impediment. So mm -hmm. looking at all these factors, uh, is there something that we can look forward to uh, in 2024 moving forward? So I, I might jump in and answer that and say, look, I think recovery is a tool that um, it doesn't actually cost anything to implement necessarily. Uh, it can be um, developed and delivered by uh, people who are going through their own recovery journeys, uh, who can start their own groups, for instance. It doesn't need clinicians. It doesn't necessarily need a budget, though, of course, that's, that would be, you know, way, way better. Um, and, and so if I had a hope for 2024, it was that it would be that more mental health services supported that. Um, Peter, anything you wanted to add? No, I think it's I think it's exactly that. I think that's that's something that's so stuck in the narrative around mental health that in order to change things, we need more clinicians, more psychologists, more psychiatrists. I don't think that's the case. I think we need to get the voice of people that actually know what's best for them more forward. And and that doesn't that doesn't necessarily need more money. That requires a culture change. And and I and I think that's that's where that's where the, the progress will be found, really. Thanks, Peter. And Renu, thanks for highlighting those important issues. Michelle Funk, can I, Funk, can I ask you to, um, uh, your question, please? Yes, thank you so much. Um, I thought it was interesting, the comment before and the distinction between the individual sessions that can happen and the group sessions. But actually, I think um, what's maybe even more important is what is happening in terms of maybe the traditional treatment approach in the service versus this recovery approach and how do they interface? Because ideally, the, it should be the recovery plan in which, you know, the traditional ways of thinking about treatment are integrated, whether it's medication, um, other forms of therapy. So I'm interested to hear your thoughts on that and how they can get integrated. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. We're, we're, um, 
um, a smaller service. Uh, so uh, all the clinicians will will kind of, are kind of cycling through, taking the leading the recovery group. So everybody's kind of getting that uh, build up of the of the knowledge around recovery and around uh, human rights based approaches. But we're also including uh, aspects of. Uh, aspects of the of recovery and, and definitions around recovery and the new way of thinking around mental health in all our groups. So that's that's something that we've we've been trying to integrate more more widely. And and I would agree that really it should be it should be the 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 treatment options that are built in around a person's recovery plan rather than the recovery plan being being a kind of add on or a stick on extra. And and that's something I think that 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 perhaps uh, uh, has to happen at a, at a at a wider system level, but also in the way that clinicians talk about these tools and and talk about their usefulness and how they should be used. That this is the kind of this is the document from which everything springs, not something extra. Thank you so much for that. Uh, it was really wonderful hearing some of these creative ideas uh, about. Um, about uh, adapting and integrating recovery approaches. And as, as Michelle said, making them central to the approach that's taken um, in support and care uh, and on people's recovery journeys. Um, what I might do now is move on to our next uh, speaker, uh, Alexi. Um, Alexi, you're going to um, discuss actions in Ukraine. I wonder whether you're ready to start. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you, Gregory. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm happy to see all of you. Uh, and I would like to uh, share with you uh, some of Ukrainian uh, experience. I will start uh, from small uh, history uh, dive. So uh, before the health care reform, uh, which was started in Ukraine in 2016, uh, psychiatric care was provided uh, through inpatient uh, and outpatient services uh, and the network of these services was quite extensive. Uh, despite that, often people hesitated uh, to seek help for a long time uh, due to the stigma and uh, reported human rights violations uh, which was associated with psychiatric care. Uh, so when uh, a crisis unfolded, a person was usually uh, hospitalized uh, to uh, inpatient uh, departments uh, through uh, emergency services. Uh, so uh, in this inpatient uh, department, uh, people received uh, intensive treatment uh, with a focus on uh, pharmacological treatment and uh, often associated with coercion. Uh, the primary focus of uh, the treatment was uh, on a disease and on a symptoms. Uh, after discharge, the person was uh, referred to outpatient service uh, where support uh, was continued to be on uh, symptom management. Uh, so in this uh, extensive system, uh, the one core element was missing. Uh, it's a person uh, with the resources, with uh, capabilities, strengths, and potential. Uh, since 2015, the WHO has uh, supporting local authorities uh, by introducing new service, its mobile community uh, mental health teams. Uh, starting with four teams in 2015, uh, there are now uh, 86 such teams uh, which function across the Ukraine. Uh, from the very beginning, uh, the recovery approach was placed to the uh, center of uh, the mobile community mental health team service uh, model, uh, and the quality rights training uh, materials was used for uh, the education. Uh, of course, there was a resistance uh, from mental health specialists uh, in the beginning, uh, mostly due to misunderstanding uh, and uh, their big experience uh, in, in other services. Uh, changing the culture and attitudes uh, anyway takes time uh, and it doesn't happen in a moment, uh, in a week and even in a month. You need to invest a lot all in capacity building and training and supervisions, uh, etc. Uh, the quality rights person-centered recovery planning self-help 
tool uh, helped a lot uh, in this process. Uh, uh, it conveyed uh, the new and complex uh, essence of recovery, explained uh, in simple and practical um, and applicable language for both uh, people receiving uh, care and uh, care providers. Um, anyway, without uh, a practical tool to implement it, specialists would continue work uh, as it was before. Uh, so, uh, the recovery journey we have uh, undertaken in recent years uh, has led uh, to an incredible change in mindsets of psychiatric staff. Uh, specialists who uh, have gone through this process will never be as, as the same as they was before. Uh, we often hear uh, that they do not want to return uh, to other service uh, models uh, they were engaged before. Uh, now the, uh, they collaborate with the person uh, for the recovery uh, being driven by person's wishes, uh, goals, uh, dreams, and preferences. Uh, instead of uh, simply uh, prescribing a treatment plan based on a spectrum of symptoms, uh, as they actually did before, uh, they now start uh, by asking a person uh, what they want, uh, what their needs uh, in their life overall, uh, and what would help uh, them to feel better. Uh, the team specialists help person to identify the strengths they have and mobilize them uh, to achieve their own goals. Uh, the team now uh, sees not just illness and symptoms, but the person in all aspects of their life. This new broader perspective uh, has allowed healthcare uh, providers uh, to offer assistance that uh, is much more than just pharmacological treatment and uh, covers many areas of person's life. Uh, and for the first time in their life, people uh, using psychiatric services have begun uh, to feel that they are not the, in the that they are uh, at the center of the process and even drive it. Uh, they regain hope and uh, vision for the future. Uh, together, the person and the team uh, work as a single uh, mechanism to find ways out of crisis situation and uh, achieve recovery. Uh, the recovery approach has started to create uh, small miracles for each person. Uh, and for such teams. Uh, I think I will stop here and I will ask to uh, play the video uh, which shows uh, the work of uh, one of such teams. Хворобу склалося сама не знаю, як склалося. Була я в Італії на заробітках з чоловіком, і, і у, у 2005 році стався приступ такий сильніший. Вона е, бачила Бога, з такого більш релігійного характеру в неї були марення, маячні ідеї були. Ми викликали нормального врача, нічого не знайшов, а психіатрія, мене положили в лікарню, і я два рази лежала в Італії в лікарні. З такою хворобою легше вдома, набагато, і ми переїхали сюди, на Україну. Вона, значить, за останніх півроку два рази вже лежала в лікарні, тобто ми маємо госпіталізм, часто вона поступає. Наша задача, в першу чергу, це не допускати подальших госпіталізацій. Поки що ми з цим справляємося, вона є стан достатньо стабільний. Дана пацієнтка – чудово яскрава особистість, вона є працюючою. І хвороба її вибиває з колії. Тоді вона не спроможна ні працювати, ні нормально функціонувати. У мене свій світ, з'являється ще один світ у голові. І я думаю, що я роблю добре, а я вже роблю свої. Я вже живу в своєму світі. Коли перший раз ми пішли до нашої першої пацієнтки, було переживання, та як воно має бути. Це, це ну, не в стінах лікарні, це вдома. Як буде пацієнт себе поводити. Але пройшло все чудово, до сих пір наша ця пацієнтка в нашому сервісі. Дуже задоволена, ми задоволені роботою, те, як вона себе почуває, як пройшло її, можна сказати, навіть перевтілення, вона зовсім по-інакшому себе побачила. 
В плані відновлення, вона писала, для виповнення моєї цілі, моєї мети, треба 100 років. Ми почали працювати на здивування навіть нам самим. Коли ці зміни пішли, прийшло всього на всього півтора тижня. Те, що не могло статися за 100 років, сталося за тиждень. Сімейні, там, бюджетні питання, ми допомогли їм розібратися і деякими е, боргами. Була проблема у них із виключенням газу. Газ також підключили. Основне – це повернення пацієнта у соціум, щоб, він, е, щоб зменшити стигматизацію пацієнта. І щоб люди інші також відносилися до пацієнта відповідно. Щоб ніде не казали, що от він психічно хворий, він вже нічого не може. Ні, наша задача все ж таки такого пацієнта повернути назад до соціуму, щоб він не відрізнявся особливо нічим від інших людей. Посада називається секретар-друкарка. Насправді вона виконує безліч різних функціональних обов'язків. Вона постійно хоче розвиватися, вона постійно щось хоче вчити. Вона підходить до мене і каже, давайте ми зробимо цифрову освіту, давайте ми оптимізуємо якусь мою роботу, пов'язану з комп'ютером. Я знаю, що наші фахівці ем, отримали шалене задоволення від тренінгів, від семінарів. Дуже хотіли набувати ці навики, вони відгукнулись, вони хотіли працювати, я думаю, що за новими правилами. І сподіваюся, завдячуючи підтримці ВОЗ, тому що навіть ті можливості, які надала ВОЗ, для нас це, ну, повірте, діковінка, ми дуже раді. Пацієнти хочуть, щоб існував цей сервіс наш. Ну, хочеться, хочеться працювати в такому форматі, в сервісі цьому мультидисциплінарному комарі. Ну, бажання велике. Оці мобільні бригади – це надзвичайно потрібна річ, надзвичайно. Хто не розуміє, хто не був хворий, то цього не пойме ніколи. А от хворі люди – це надзвичайно добре, що вдома, в рідні стіни допомагають, як то кажуть. Thank you very much for that video and uh, the presentation, Alexi. Is there anything else that you wanted to add after the video or reflect on from the video? Uh, maybe a few words. Uh, it's uh, the team from Chernivtsi uh, and the team is continuing functioning. Uh, uh, and uh, those lady who was in the video, uh, she feels well and she continues his work. Uh, so <laughs> everyone is fine and uh, I will stop here. That's great. Um, Alexi, one of the things that uh, um, I heard you say towards the end was that you felt that miracles had come out of this approach. And I was reflecting on what that meant or, or what that could have meant. And um, I was thinking, um, in, in a way, I was reflecting back to some of the, um, the words that Jan had shared. Um, and the courage that it takes to start your own recovery journey and um, the hope that uh, people find in their own recovery journeys. Um, and in uh, the woman who's, um, whose story uh, uh, was shared during that video, I did feel a sense of her hope, which is really that central, um, essential factor to that recovery journey. Um, so uh, there, there was also, I guess, um, I mean, I just wanted to also reflect on and, uh, you know, just express a huge amount of, uh, uh, I'm just humbled by the, the huge work that um, the team have done in Ukraine, building up from such a small number up to more than 80 teams now. Um, and imagining the uh, not just the, the volume, but also the impact on all of, the, all of those people's lives in recovery too, the hope um, and the courage that people have found um, and have been able to move forward. And, and also hearing about the clinicians and their changes. And I'm wondering, Alexi, um, I, I noticed that there are a couple of, of comments, maybe um, some some words in the in the video that we are that we're trying to change, like patient and illness. Are you seeing some changes in language like that to move to move towards a more person centered language and more person centered approaches over time? What's been your experience? Uh, well. Uh... 
we often hear it uh, uh, across um, may maybe all the teams with uh, which we worked, uh, uh, which we provided uh, trainings, uh, uh, and uh, it's uh, anyway long process, uh, but uh, uh, still we see across all the teams which uh, we trained, uh, all of them change uh, their mind. Uh, and uh, it's a really a miracle because uh, even those uh, psychiatrists who had uh, a big uh, experience of work in inpatient uh, services uh, and they actually uh, was pushed to work in this uh, well community mental health team, they didn't want to at first, uh, even they, uh, after complete of education, start to change in mindset uh, and uh, they worked uh, in such teams with pleasure that, that's fantastic jacob i might actually reach out to you and ask a question yeah. while i'm waiting for some other people to ask questions too so we were hearing about this uh, i mean this massive upscaling of, of of the recovery approach as a central approach to care um and the change in culture in in um in in mental health clinicians and 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 service people what's been yeah. your experience with that that culture change in zimbabwe just with the um the quality rights training as a foundation and uh, maybe could you talk talk to that for us oh thanks for that um i remember when we concluded one of the trainings at uh, the biggest psychiatric facility in the country we had um, one of the nurses saying, I feel like I need to make an apology to all my clients um, because of the way that she had been treating them before getting an orientation on the quality rights. So definitely there has been a, a change in, in attitude and practice um, by the clinicians who have gone through the training. And within the community, um, oh. since the training has also been rolled out to uh, peer, uh, peer led groups, uh, community health workers championed by organizations such as the Friendship Bench uh, and the National Association of Persons with Psychosocial Disabilities, we have seen um, a direct change as well uh, within community based interventions. So, yeah, the quality rights intervention is working um, and leading to changes in attitudes and practices. That's very exciting. I mean, it's a foundation, isn't it? That is is, is so exciting. Um, I, I'm going to jump to Peter soon, but I did see that um, we have um, Orest um, Suvalo who's asked a question. Orest, would you um, please speak for us? Thank you. Thank you very much for giving me a word. So it's a big pleasure to be here and thank you colleagues from WHO and OXC from good presentation. I just wanted to reflect the mobile team issue in Ukraine. I'm psychiatrist also from Ukraine. And I so, like look at, at the development of mobile team uh, process launched by WHO, and this very good option that existed already in Ukraine, supported by the state. And this is very important. This is part of the system of mental health in Ukraine who give additional options to provide services for people. And in my region, I see how specialists are inspired now to to provide different type of service and see how they can be could be useful to uh, support the recovery of people in communities as in a video to cover some social issues to cover some issue with employment and uh, this is very difficult time for ukraine now because we are launching and making these changes during the war and we see also the new like challenges which appeared due to the war to the Russian invasion and this also one of the options that could be and are helpful for people to recover to recover them especially uh, in in during the, the shelling or after shelling or working with some consequences of the war for for communities so thank you for this opportunity and also when we are talking about the quality rights I think that uh, I like this instrument very much because this is like also the changing of mindset. And this is especially challenging for the post-totalitarian country as Ukraine is when we are trying to 
introduce this instrument into practice. And as OXC said, most of this now in training. And I hope that more people, especially from mental health field, will, will know about this instrument, will use it. And thank you, WHO, for one more time, because we have already all this instrument translated into Ukraine. And I think that we will work hard to promote this and introduce more in a practice. Thank you for support. That's uh, beautifully put, um, Orest. Thank you so much for that. Uh, you, you really highlighted a very important point here, and that is that um, recovery if a recovery approaches uh, a recovery approach and these changes can happen in a country at war they can happen anywhere if people of ukraine can build this approach and integrate a rights-based recovery approach a human rights-based approach uh now then there's no excuse for any of us to miss out on this for people anywhere in the world to miss out on this so I, I just want to, I guess, pay tribute to the huge effort of the team um, and all of the individual participants in that team too. Um, so thank you so much for that. Um, I wonder, Peter, do you have any reflections on um, what Alexi had shared um, about, uh, um, I guess, about the challenges that, um, that Ukraine is going through um, I guess, compared to some of the challenges that you've gone through in Norway. Mm -hmm. I, I, I really buy into your idea, Greg, that, that if the, this can happen in a country at, uh, actively at, at war at the moment, then there really is no excuse. And I'm, I'm always quite struck by the resistance that, that you know you can meet along the way perhaps in countries with slightly more resources or or more political space to implement resources uh that that there is still a kind of inbuilt culture particularly in the context i'm in that that um that the only way to get proper help perhaps is to be admitted to a place and i think there th that's a that's a a dynamic a kind of underlying uh, uh, theme that things like the uh, things like the outreach teams that alexi's discussing that that really challenges it shows that that actually you can get good help at home where you live in your community, still being connected to the things that create meaning in your life and that connect you to all those resources that you have inside yourself. And I feel, feel that's the that's another one of the dynamics that that needs to change. And I know here in the Norwegian context, we're we're behind in terms of outreach teams, crises teams, uh, decamping from our clinics and from hospitals and, and getting into the community per, to provide support. I kind of feel absolutely essential. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Peter. I wonder, I'm going to put this question out to the audience, whether there are, whether there are I'm sure, I'm positive that there are uh, um, people out there, people with lived experience, people who are clinicians, um, who have experience in their own country of, um, of scaling up a recovery approaches. And if you'd like to um, have a, a brief word and, and share that experience with us, please put up your hand. We'd love to hear from you. Um, in the meantime, um, I guess, um, uh, um, yeah, I'm, uh, I think we will be uh, coming up to the end of, of our discussion soon. Um, so, uh, um, yeah, as I said, if anyone's got any questions, that would be fantastic. Um, uh, I, I do think that the um, that one of the things that I was thinking about before and I, I wanted to come back to was um, the, I guess, um, one of the things that you were talking about right at the beginning, Peter, about um, a, that people's recovery approaches don't need to be written. Um, you know, a lot of recovery approaches are about lists or about the things that people would do. You talked about um, artistic approaches. Uh, and I just wonder whether you could expand a bit on that because in a lot of the world, people don't necessarily have um, the level of literacy that might be required, but they could express themselves in this way, or they they um, they might be neurodiverse and they have a different way of expressing um, their recovery goals or their recovery journey. So um, I wonder whether I could ask you to speak to that. Yeah, I, I mean, again, where that kind of 
came from, I, I think, is is really trying to drive home that message and 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 get it uh, get it across that that it is up to the person themselves how they interact to that. And again, if we're thinking about the 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 supported decision model uh, uh, approach that's kind of central in quality rights and the human rights approach, that yeah, we should be thinking more actively about how we can how we can adapt and grow uh, uh, recovery plans around different uh, different models. Models, different ways of making decisions. I, I think you know our experience in the Norwegian context is, is that creativity is is really quite an important way into people's values, uh, um, their own opinion of themselves, and and the ability to express their wishes and desires. That creativity is a massive has a massive role to play there, and that's why we've had people that that have had art projects, uh, uh, songwriting projects around this where they they. They feel they've been able to capture something in a much more nuanced living way um, through their creativity uh, and that that's perhaps even more easily shared um, uh, and, and that can be used even, even in, in, a, in a crisis situation. I also kind of had a, a, an association to, to uh, I, I've done a few quality rights training in, 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 the, in the kind of some of the Pacific islands where there's a lot of talk about collectivist culture and and how sometimes that idea of recovery planning we can fall into a trap where it becomes individualized and we perhaps have to remember as well that there are other cultures out there that have more collective approaches to decision making and and how we can kind of create space for that 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 perhaps if people want to have a recovery plan that they develop with their family that they develop with their local communities that that there should also be be space for that as well but again i think that comes back to implementing learning from people with lived experience and making the appropriate changes i think i think that's uh, that's often the best way to make sure that all uses of these uh, work, uh tools and, and approaches are receptive to feedback receptive to change that we grow and develop them based on on people with lived experience Thank you, Peter. Very iterative approach. Continue to to reflect um, and and develop and strengthen. Um, Michelle, you had your hand up. Thanks. Thanks again. Um, I wanted to make, I thought, a, a comment about the language of recovery because I think that's really interesting. Mm. So we saw in you, and as you mentioned, Greg, we saw in the video. Um, the word patient and illness being used quite a bit, and that's not the recovery language, which would be more like a person and so on. And I know you mentioned that. What I find really interesting, and, and it's just going to take a long time to change this, despite the language, the approach was recovery oriented, you know, the approach being used. And, and I just think that it's great you know, for the language to evolve and change over time, but it doesn't mean that recovery approaches aren't being used, even if the language hasn't. And also the converse. I mean, I know that there are services who call themselves recovery oriented and person centered, but basically the name has changed, but the philosophy and how they operate has not. And their traditional, uh, you know, symptom reduction, diagnosis based, um, services so it's very interesting this thing you can never just go on the the title and the language you've got to look more deeply so that's just one comment but just also want to um throw a question out there to our speakers if i may um so you know you know the the service in norway went through its own process and also in the ukraine my question is um you know, if for any other country who wanted to set up a, a recovery-oriented service or introduce recovery-oriented uh, plans as tools in the service, what are the five big, you know, the five steps that you must take or you should take to sort of make it all happen from, you know, maybe convincing the management through to, you know, the more detailed implementation? I'd be interested to hear that, Greg, if we have some time or not. I don't know. Yeah. Yes, we do. We have time for that. And we'll we'll have time for another question after that too, actually. So we do. Thank you, Michelle. Um, who would like to respond to that? Maybe I, I ask Alexi, do you have 
Would you like to respond to Michelle first? Well, actually, it's a quite difficult question. Uh, it's a bit difficult to say that you should do these five steps because uh, it's uh, really a huge and it's a very wide process uh, to establish such, such service. Uh, but anyway, uh, it uh, requires uh, maybe mostly a lot of mind changing uh, among different sectors. So maybe uh, you will go uh, after you will answer uh, the questions which... Uh, so so uh, what the categories of people should change their mindset first? Uh, I cannot say that some of them should do it earlier than another, but anyway, you should uh, be sure uh, that you can cover uh, hospital management, specialists who provide uh, support, uh, people who need this support, uh, uh, and society. Uh, so it's a close society where the people live. M maybe it's uh, from what we should start. So it's uh, parents, it's relative, and so on. Uh, and our work with uh, Mobile Community Mental Health Team required it to uh, work with these categories uh, of people. Uh, and uh, starting from uh, hospital management and specialists who work in these teams. Uh, and after that, uh, uh, anyway, this team is uh, interacting with the people uh, who is receiving support with their families, their friends, their relatives, uh, and so on. I really love that description, Alexi, about uh, changing minds and thinking about the different levels, uh, you know, the, the changing minds of, of the person themselves, uh, about the way that they see themselves and that hope and courage I was talking about, about their families, about empowering them, about the their communities and society in general. It's a huge challenge, but certainly achievable. And you've demonstrated that. And Ukraine is demonstrating that in action, as is Zimbabwe. Um, and that level, the, cl the clinical level as well, and, and changing minds there. Thank you so much for that. That's um, fantastic. Peter. Yeah, uh, I'm going to try and raise the challenge, Michelle, and come with five points. Uh, uh, so the first one I was kind of noting down was use the WHO materials. There is so much stuff in there. It's unbelievable, the stuff that's been gathered over the last 10 years. You, you can build 15,000 different therapy models around what's already there. So that that's kind of, you know, the, 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 the beauty of the recovery approach is we're not reinventing the wheel. We're doing something that's implicit, that's grounded in human rights that we've known since the end of the Second World War that everybody has in them. So I would that would be my first point. The second point would be, I think, Build a build a narrative around quality improvement and new therapy approaches because I, I think that is some that's a language that leadership understand that's a language that 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 serve people that are responsible for services understand they want to give better offers to people they want to uh, to try and uh, meet challenges in different and novel ways and I think there's so much novel and tr transformative stuff in the recovery plan in the quality right stuff that 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 that's the way to sell it in. I think the third point would be get people with lived experience involved from, from day one, you know, kind of build it in around your local context. Make sure that you, you've, if you're doing something new, that this makes sense to people from user organizations from uh, uh, that, that know this field inside out and that, that have lived it themselves. A fourth point I would think would be, I think we should be afraid to to kind of say that we are working with kind of quite core therapeutic themes here. I think when you're talking about the ability to uh, make your own decisions, to be in touch with your own values, with your own meanings on what you want to get out of life, that's that's therapy stuff. And I, I think we can we can say that quite loudly and proudly. And that's a language that I think that clinical colleagues understand and, and people that are looking for support want to hear as well perhaps and then the final point would be 
implement, reassess, change, and try and spread it as much as possible. We, we've had a bit of a model where I've brought in observers uh, to the courses that are from different backgrounds, that are from lower, uh, uh, from, uh, from kind of more uh, locally based teams and other organizations. So, so try and use your pilot project to spread the word as well. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that, Peter. Um, what I might do, because we're just about to run out of time, and I did want to grab, uh, I did want to ask Jacob's perspective on this. Um, again, sure. Jacob, you, you've um, you've shared some some really valuable insights. What what would be your response to Michelle on this? Well, my my top five actions would be number one, um, have multi stakeholder engagement. So engaging government, engaging development uh, community, engaging the private sector, which is the world of work. Uh, where a lot of opportunities for people would uh, naturally lie, and also get academia involved as well. Uh, coming up with facility-based interventions uh, within the healthcare facilities and the service providers to get them fully acquainted with this intervention um, and to help delivery of it from the facility. Uh, implementing it within the community would be my number three getting the community involved as widely as possible. So the service users themselves, their family members, uh, and other community um, stakeholders, then empowering the service users um, through networking and support groups. So linkages to different services so that there's always that um, unity and collaboration among service users and people with lived experience. And um, one thing I'm passionate about and also working on in Zimbabwe with the different stakeholders is building a national database of people with lived experience. So within that database, we'll be able to monitor um, how much progress is being made. And it could also be a repository for people to bank um, their recovery plans. Because when a crisis happens um, and the community is made aware and the health service providers are also aware that there is such a repository, um, the recovery plans can easily be pulled out. Um, so those would be my top five uh, proposals. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jacob. Uh, I, I guess I'm going to um, round this up before I hand over to Michelle and say that recovery, the process of recovery, it started in the social justice movement. Um, and it was led by people with lived experience and it was it came from them it was directed by them so I this is where we really need to come come back to the beginning and the end and the middle is people with lived experience this is um is their plan it's uh, it's the their it's 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 for their care um and it's directed by them so whatever we do it should come back to that at at the um at the end um, and Michelle, I wonder whether you would mind um, uh, summarizing for us. Thank you so well, much. Um, well, I, I'm not I'm not going to summarize because I think you know it's yes. been very rich yes. and we are coming to an end. But I did just want to thank everyone. Um, Greg, I want to thank you very much for moderating this session. It was fantastic. Uh, I think we had 129 at the beginning and we've got 120 people still with us. So that's pretty good for a 90 minute session where, you know, so many people are uh, very busy. So, we're, you know, I think that that's testament to the fact that this has been really engaging and helpful for people. I, I hope um, that that is correct. Um, so thank you so much, Greg, for moderating that. And of course, thank you so much to our speakers. Uh, Peter, Jan, Jacob, Alexi, um, you know, it was absolutely fabulous, fabulous to hear your insights and have your contributions and experiences. Um, of course, thank you for uh, to everyone for joining this uh, webinar. And please do mark your calendars for the next webinar because it is on supported decision making and it's scheduled for the 19th of June at uh, 3 to 4.30 CEST, CES, so same timeline as now, um, European summertime. Um, and the difference for this webinar is that it's going to be interpreted, it's gonna have simultaneous interpretation in English and Spanish as well. So we're really grateful for that. And it's a um, Catalonia government that's supporting the uh, webinar. 
uh, just want to draw your attention to the resources that Natalie is putting into the chat or has put into the chat around the quality rights e-training, which we've mentioned, and um, some other resources, I think. So please do take a look at them if you are not already familiar with them. And yeah, thank you all once again for your contributions, your engagement and enthusiasm. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye for now.